Good evening. My, my name is Marisela Garcia. I'm the Race Equity Director for Advocacy for Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families. And I'm joined by Tomiko Townley uh, and Osiris Bali. Uh, Tomiko is from the Arkansas Hunger Relief Alliance. She's the Advocacy Director. And Osiris is with the Arkansas Public Policy Panel, and he is the Racial Equity Coordinator. I want to let you know that we are recording this tonight. Um, this presentation will be placed on our Facebook page so that if you have to leave early, you'll be able to come back and watch it later, but it is being recorded so that you know. Um, if you have any questions, we ask that you please put them in the chat. We will uh, answer questions at the end of the presentation. And if we don't, if we run out of time, uh, we will uh, respond by email if needed. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask Rebecca for next slide, please. So today we're going to be talking about SNAP or EBT Administrative Advocacy. Um, we're going to do an overview of SNAP in Arkansas. Then we're going to talk about uh, administrative advocacy overall. We're going to talk about advocating effectively. And then how can we develop a shared agenda for advocacy? Those are our goals for tonight. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Tamika. Thanks, Maricela. So here's a slide with a whole lot of words. Um, but really what I want to say is that, well, first of all, thank you all for being here at 6 p.m. on a Thursday. Um, Second of all, thank you, Maricela and Osiris, for being willing to talk about SNAP advocacy, period, let alone at 6 p.m. on a Thursday. Um, and my role with the Alliance is really to increase the knowledge and also information about SNAP access in the state of Arkansas. And um, so what I want to do is give you a little bit of framing for the conversation that we're going to have for the rest of the hour. Um, and I think part of doing that is understanding why SNAP was created. And SNAP is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as Food Stamps. Um, on the slide, you'll see some pictures of the actual stamps that were created. Um, this program's origins go back to 1939, and it was really not to address the needs of poor people in the United States. It was really to help with um, the surplus of food and the unemployment rates that were very high at the time. Um, and so it, in the origins of SNAP, this program was not meant to feed people who are hungry. This program was to help address the surplus foods and it required any person that was receiving assistance from the government in another form to purchase stamps. Um, so when you would purchase stamps, you would get a certain amount of food stamps that would allow you to purchase commodity items. So those are the pictures of the stamps that I have up on this slide. Um, and from 1939 through the 1940s and 50s, um, this program was not nationwide. There were um, pilot programs around the United States. It wasn't until 1964 that there was a permanent program established. And it was really focused on strengthening the ag community and creating opportunities for people to incorporate more nutrition, more nutritious items into their diet. Um, and then the program began to expand in the 16 and 60s and 70s. Um, by 1977, there was a national uh, piece of legislation that passed called the Food and Agriculture Act. And then through the 80s and the 2000s, we saw major cuts to this program. So awesome things happened in this time frame. Horrible things happened in this time frame because this program was, was initially set up to not serve people who were living in poverty, but to help people in the farming community. This program was really not set up for national implementation um, in areas of high need. 
meaning that this program has historic roots in racism and inequity and um, sexism. So understandably, when we get to the 1980s and 1990s, we're going to see people cutting back on it, trying to address things that we knew existed but did not trace in the beginning, like fraud. So there's millions of dollars that are spent on um, studying and identifying SNAP fraud in the program. And we know that SNAP is one of the, well, it's it's the federal program that has the least amount of fraud um, in all of our federal programs, which says something with the amount of money that we spend on anti-fraud programs. So the other thing is that Arkansas's governor who became the president, President Clinton instituted the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, which changed welfare as we know it. And those are his words. So um, this made a program that was built to address the needs of ag and address the needs of poor people into a work program. Um, and we are seeing some of those effects right now. And Rebecca, if you don't mind switching the slides, that'd be great. Um, so SNAP in Arkansas is not like SNAP in other states. Um, it is the same framework. So SNAP is a federal program. It is an entitlement program, which means that anybody who is eligible for this program should have access to it. If there are barriers to that access, um, in theory, there are ways to get around those barriers. Um, Arkansas has historically made this program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, harder to access through state legislation. Um, and that's part of the beauty of SNAP is it's a federal program, it's an entitlement program, but states have to submit plans every year to tell the federal government how they're going to implement this program in their state. The state legislature has some pull in this, as well as the federal government regulating authority, USDA, FNS. So some of this information we have no control over, but some of it we do. So this slide is about the eligibility in Arkansas for the number of people in the household, their gross monthly income, maximum income after you take out taxes. Um, and then you also are trying to take away the um, expenses that you have as a household. So there's two separate categories in Arkansas at this moment. There are people who have folks in their home who are 60 and older or somebody in their home who has a disability and receives disability benefits. And then there's also households that are the majority of the SNAP households, over 70% that are working households with kids. Um, and this is just a very basic eligibility sheet. So it's not in depth. There are a whole lot of other barriers and hoops that people have to overcome and jump through to get benefits. Um, but this is one of the tools that we provide people who are helping people apply for SNAP. And I'm ready for the next slide, whenever. So what are those barriers that people might face just to apply for a benefit that they qualify for or they believe they qualify for? Um, since this program is a zillion years old, um, there are a whole lot of misconceptions and um, feelings and stigma around applying for and accepting SNAP. And I put these up here. Um, they don't explain a whole lot, so I'm just going to walk through them. But um, some of the major issues that we found, and I've, I've been a SNAP application assister for the past six years in Arkansas, and some of the primary reasons that people struggle to access a benefit that they're eligible for are heartbreaking. Um, they're, they're barriers that should not exist for folks that are struggling to feed themselves through the end of the month, including um, negative experiences that they're having with the SNAP office, a caseworker, or even the person at the front desk. 
um, transportation barriers that they might face depending on where they live. Or even in Little Rock, if you don't have the money for the bus and you are, it's 115 degrees outside and it feels like an impossible task to get to the DHS office, let alone if you have any mobility challenges, um, it could be physically impossible for you to get to the DHS office within the hours that they're open. Literacy is another huge barrier to accessing SNAP in the state of Arkansas. We know that many people, um, well, including me, I mean, the application is now 32 pages long. Um, what went from a four page application is now 32 pages. And when I see that booklet of questions, I am overwhelmed with the amount of information that they're asking for. I can't imagine what somebody who is food insecure, maybe in a place of crisis, um, has experienced trauma, may have a literacy challenge, all of those things would look at that application and say like, this is not for me. This is clearly not meant to be accessible for me. Um, the racist policies, we've heard horror stories from people who speak Spanish. Um, they speak English too, but they speak Spanish as their primary language. And when they went to ask for an application, they were told that they didn't qualify which is not true simply because you speak Spanish. Um, SNAP is available for citizens, but to automatically assume that somebody is not a citizen simply because they speak a different language is um, unacceptable and discriminatory. So those, those instances, unfortunately, do not get documented because if you are able to push people away from applying for a program that they're eligible for, now we have no data that we have to turn over to the feds from the state. So I believe, um, I'm not gonna put Osiris or Maricela in this same category, but from my experiences with the DHS offices around the state, it does feel like there's a culture of keeping people away. It doesn't mean that we have the research to prove that that exists, but what we hear anecdotally from a lot of our SNAP participating households is that whether it's trying to keep their benefits that they qualified for or when they applied for those benefits or friends that they have they know have applied for their benefits they have been met with resistance at the county office um that is not to say that caseworkers are not amazing and that caseworkers are paid adequately um, for the services they that they provide many of the caseworkers are overworked underpaid and expected to deal with a whole lot of challenges that they may not be trained for. So um, I think the biggest piece of understanding the barriers that people face is knowing that we are not trying to solve these barriers when we're talking about SNAP administrative advocacy. Um, we That's the ultimate goal is that none of these barriers exist, right? But at the end of the day, depending on who you're talking with, the end goal might be, I just need to get through this process to receive a very minimal benefit for food. Um, Maricela, Osiris, and I might be like, we are going to address this system that is inequitable, and the way that we're going to do that is collecting information and going to the state and trying to address some of these barriers. Um, so people might have different goals, but for SNAP participants, what I have found very, very helpful in the initial administrative advocacy role is you have every right to ask for what policy supports what you're hearing. You have every right to ask for help when you're applying for the program. You have every right to question what doesn't feel proper and doesn't feel like a fair way to be treated, um, including some of these barriers that we're talking about. So there are protections in place at the federal level and the state level that many people are discouraged from utilizing. Um, and these are just some of them. And, you know, I didn't mention trauma, but trauma is a huge one. If you've had any experience as a child navigating the public benefit system system with your family, you might have an aversion to doing it as an adult. 
um, or you might have very specific feelings about accessing help. And I'm ready for my next slide. I think I have one more. I don't, I'm gonna pass it back. Miko, I just, uh, I also wanna add, so you mentioned um, literacy, but also now the push to do everything online in a state that doesn't have great internet or cellular access um, and making an application be 32 pages long can make it really um, hard for someone who doesn't have great access um, and maybe has to fill it out on their phone because they don't have Wi-Fi or, you know, um, good landline access to internet. Um, that makes it really, really difficult. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And language, you know, we've talked about that too, Maricela, that there are not uh, translators and people who are at every single office to be able to support families that speak another language. Um, yeah, huge barriers, unacceptable barriers. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, um, I just wanna mention everybody that we also have live transcription on. So you, you should see a button at the bottom that says live transcript um, and you can um, uh, see the subtitles if you need to see them or if you want to see them. Um, and that will also be included in the video record when we upload that. Um, Osiris, we're going to turn it over to you to talk about advocacy. All right, thank you, Marisola. Uh, my name is Osiris Bali. I'm the Racial Equity Coordinator um, with the Arkansas Public Policy Panel. Also, I am with the Citizens First Congress, and I have just a few brief uh, details about uh, administrative advocacy, just an overview. And so just the definition of administrative advocacy is encompassing a variety of positions concerned with the influence of formation and application of change of rules that government agencies put in place to implement statutory law. Administrative advocacy takes place on all levels uh, of government, federal, state, and local. And just to kind of piggyback off what Tamiko was talking about, we administrative advocacy is, uh, we're trying to explain that to provide better access to public benefits but we know that the uh, public benefits program has a history of racism um, that's been documented throughout history from uh, things like the mother's pension to Reagan's uh, welfare queen to uh, even Clinton's 96 uh, welfare reform and uh, workfare programs. We've seen it over and over again. And so that's why I try to make it a point to stress uh, the title of the work that I do, which is bringing a racial equity lens to, uh, to work for all people in our community, communities and in our state. And so, you know, um, racial, racial equity is defined as systemic fair treatment of all people resulting in fair opportunities and outcomes for everyone. Racial equity is not just, just the absence of discrimination, but also the presence of values and systems that ensure justice and fairness. And so uh, just uh, on this slide right here, you see the, uh, just the values, the core values of what uh, equity and racial equity is. Uh, distribution of resources, recognition, participa uh, participation, transformation, effects, and access. And so uh, I always encourage everybody that when you're doing advocacy work to lean on uh, looking through things from a racial equity lens because we know that, you know, so we have certain outcomes that we want to see in this advocacy process. One uh, being with racial equity is um, we no longer want to see people determined by their socioeconomic outcomes. We want everyone to thrive no matter where they live and who they are. And also as a process, we want racial equity to, uh, to be most impacted by the people that are doing the work uh, to end structural racial inequity and to do that meaningful work in a creative way and to implement uh, radical policies and practices that impact our lives. And so uh, you can go to the next slide. Actually, you can skip, uh, we, we can show this slide too, but this is more about the work of racial equity. And this uh, is showing that, you know, we have to let our voices be heard when we're doing this advocacy work. And uh, especially in this time and age where we have so many false narratives uh, being presented, you know, so we wanna make sure that people, when we are doing the advocacy work, wanna make sure people are loud and, but, correct at the same time that we bring in the proper message 
uh, to the people that uh, are directly impacted by this work. So you can go to the next slide, please. And so we're talking about uh, basically administrative advocacy happening on all the different levels in government from federal to state. And um, on the federal level, you know what I'm saying, we're um, on the federal level, you, on the state level, I'm sorry, you're dealing with, you know, uh, representatives of state senators, the governors. Uh, these are the people who set the laws and set the policies, policies for our states. And, and, it's, and it's worth mentioning that um, the implementation of these laws a lot of times are handed over to the state agencies. And so it's important to get to know uh, the people that are the state administrators and the state agencies. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. And so uh, this slide is just the logo of the Arkansas uh, Department of Human Services. And the reason why you know I, I have this logo up there is when we do an administrative advocacy, it's important to start building a relationship with the program administrators um, at the DHS, you have uh, everybody um, from the DHS secretary to the DHS deputy director of children and youth, uh, the chief communications and uh, community engagement officer, the chief legislative and intergovernmental affairs officer, and the D deputy director of health and Medicaid director. And so uh, when you're doing the work for advocacy, you want to make sure that you're making yourself familiar to these people because uh, oftentimes, these people are, are very unfamiliar with the advocacy, uh, the advocates for this work. And so uh, my first just step would be just getting your foot in the door uh, to start that administrative advocacy process, uh, to learn about the, the policy changes that are being taken place and uh, make sure that they're open to public comment. And so that you create the opportunities for other advocates so that they can weigh in too. And so if there are any uh, advisory boards or any ways that you can work in a collaborative effort with state administrators, you know what I'm saying? I highly encourage that. And a lot of times we get caught up with a lot of the complaints a lot of times. And these people who are the staff of the DHS, you know, they don't make all of the rules. So, you know, a lot of times you can give your critiques, but I always encourage people to not only just give critiques, but try to figure out ways you can offer solutions. And you do that. Uh, through, you know, just proposing just concrete solutions and even backing up your, um, backing up your solutions with data and, you know, saying, I guess, firsthand stories and account from the people that you encounter in the, uh, in the community who have been affected by this. Um, also, also, you, I encourage everybody that's involved in administrative advocacy to try to engage in a, um, a variety of advocacy partners. Working with the Citizens First Congress, one of the biggest things that that has taught me is the importance of talking to the decision makers with the coalition group. So coalition, build, coalition building is, is great. It's great to have a diverse group of advocates that are all uh, on one accord with their priorities and their goals. And that's something that CFCs always stress during the legislative sessions and throughout, uh, just throughout the year anyway to uh, help overcome those barriers that we all face in the communities. And so uh, coalition building is uh, very key because it's one way to educate multiple people in the community, but it also reaching outside of your network to make sure that y'all have a, a bigger collective effort. Uh, when, you're, when you're working with your institutions, a lot of times we get caught up in, uh, in that membership base and those people that are engaged a lot of times and we kind of forget uh, the people that are not interacting with us on a regular basis. And so it's all about you know, coalition building and bringing those organizations in so you have a stronger voice when you have multiple groups represented and uh, so many different suggestions. And that's ways that, you know what I'm saying, you can increase the access to the benefits. Um, also, you want to continue to build that relationship with the uh, state administrators on administrative advocacy level because you want to understand how the program works. A lot of times we have questions that, uh, you know, we haven't been able to, you know, voice to other people or, you know, when we deny, sometimes people just kind of give up. And so as advocates, we have to be there standing on the front line to always be willing to offer like the solutions 
and educate people on the process and understand and understanding what's going on in in those programs. There are many ways that you can do this. A lot of times, you you can try to establish the uh, regular meetings with the decision makers to uh, present the opportunity to get the updates, ask ask questions, and understand the timelines that are in place for uh, when they implement new laws with these programs. Also, it's a time to be persistent and follow up with uh, the problems that applicants are facing and the, uh, the new enrollees. And so you wanna hear about all of these uh, barriers so that you can fix the enrollment process. Uh, other ways you can do that is, you know, be creative and maybe even shadowing a caseworker in these, lo in these local agencies with their permission to get a better understanding of the process of the applications and uh, how they review applications and, and verify applicants and uh, even trying to conduct interviews with people who, uh, who are part of that decision-making process. And also uh, just staying up to date on, you know, saying the administrative rules and policies and procedure, that way you can help inform and cross check a lot of times um, what's going on as far as with these, uh, the access to public benefits. Uh, we know that even with our elected officials, a lot of times they're unfamiliar with the rules and, and what's going on until we begin to reach out and get in contact with them. And so it's the same way with the DHS here in, um, in Arkansas, you know what I'm saying? They have to be aware of what's going on in order to change uh, and make those uh, solutions, uh, those equitable solutions, hopefully. And uh, we can go to my last slide, please. Uh, just another, the last part I was going to mention about administrative advocacy is especially in this age where we're in right now, where, you know, uh, COVID-19 and, and the pandemic, we have to become uh, creative with our ways that we connect to the community to uh, talk about the issues with uh, public benefits and SNAP. And so um, using social media has become a, a, a huge platform. And so uh, you have the different uh, social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, but also and Instagram, but also like new, uh, uh, platforms like TikTok, Snapchat, and that really connects to a younger generation. Uh, just personally speaking from uh, just advocating during this last legislative session, we were able to use TikTok to connect with our young people and young voters to explain different issues about um, different bills that were coming across and being filed. And using TikTok to break down and explain things, because you only have one minute to do that, was very effective to get straight to the point and uh, get into the substance of the arguments that we were trying to make with, to advocate for or against certain bills. And so TikTok is, is a great platform and it's creative to uh, be able to connect to new people, but also for uh, people that are striving to uh, work as individuals, I, I think it's a way to encourage people to, like I say, once again, coalition build. And uh, if you don't have a following or you don't have an institution that you're, associated with necessarily, that's a way to actually, you know what I'm saying, form that institution and to reach more people outside of your uh, just normal reach by connecting on social media on, on a common interest and uh, working for ways to get equitable solutions by community input. And that's, uh, that's just a, a great way and a new way to do this through social media, that advocacy work, social media should become a big part of everybody's platform when they're trying to uh, advocate uh, moving forward. So that's pretty much my overview on uh, administrative advocacy. Thank you, Osiris. Um, I just wanna add a point about social media. Um, it's really important right now uh, due to COVID, especially with our case numbers rising, we might see more of offices um, shutting down. We might see more of offices only being available at certain hours, certain times, certain days. And so um, connecting with your constituency and knowing what's happening um, it, through social media is one way that you can keep track of that. But it's also another way to connect with the people that we're trying to address, right? So sometimes it may be that you're, your true goal at that minute is to get this person their benefits because they're being unjustly denied. And if you call them out on Twitter or whatever, that might be the fastest way to get their attention if you can't get heard through a regular process. 
Um, so, so that is that is one way that social media does help. Um, when we're talking though about advocating effectively in general, one, you need to be prepared and being prepared is really complicated when we're talking about SNAP because again, it's a federal program, it's implemented by the states and that means that each state has a different way of implementing the program and has different rules and regulations. And like Tomiko said earlier, um, our state does it differently, completely differently than anybody else. Um, for example, we have the lowest asset cap um, anywhere. You cannot have more than $2,250 um, in assets. And that means that it's very difficult for people who are trying to escape poverty to, to get to use SNAP as a tool to, to uh, while they're trying to save to get out of the situation they're in. It's very, very difficult. Um, the poverty line is also, uh, I see Callie also mentioned this, the poverty line is very low. Um, and so uh, looking at the charts in advance and knowing whether or not the person that you're trying to help qualifies is, is really important. But understanding how it works in Arkansas is, is truly important because many times if you talk to state administrators or uh, you know a local DHS county office, they may think something is done that way because the federal law requires it or state law requires it. And it's not, it's done that way because that's what local policy is. And so if you are able to come with the policy and say, hey, that's not what it says. It does not say you're required to do that. Um, that is a way of being an effective advocate by being prepared. Um, and, and then the last thing, you know, uh, document everything. If, if you're really gonna be effective at advocacy, you have to pay attention to what's going on. You have to have really good notes when it happened, what office, you know, who it was, who said what, what did they direct you to? And like Tomiko said earlier, whether you're the individual applying or you're applying on somebody else's behalf, you have a right to ask for the policy. If they are saying something is required, they have to show you where it's required, either in law or by policy. Um, if they can't do that, then that is not a requirement. And if they're trying to place a burden, uh, uh, a requirement on you that is unduly burdensome, that is not relevant to the program, that is something for which you can dispute your determination of eligibility. Um, and so it's really important, I think, that if you're gonna be advocated effectively, you, you start with these th three thoughts in your mind. Next slide. So when we're talking about the process and talking about advocating effectively, um, we, we have to start with the application pro process. As Tomiko said, the application is very, very long now. It's more than 30 pages. Um, and when you sit down, we'll come to another slide that it shows you exactly what all you need at the moment that you're sitting down to fill it out. Um, but at that moment that you're filling it out, the first thing you should be looking at is whether or not you meet that income qualification. Um, and so that first slide that Tomiko showed you, or the second slide that Tomiko showed that showed if you have a household and there's one person, it's this much that you can have an income, this much in assets. Um, and this is the range of benefits that you're gonna get. You know, the maximum for a single person in uh, benefits in Arkansas is $87. So uh, to start right there, is someone going to be willing to go through all the intrusive questions, provide all the required documentation to get $87? They're only going to do it if they're hungry. So starting at the application point, you have to be prepared with all of the things that are required because you cannot come back and, and fill it out later. It's going to be denied. That's how it's going to happen. Uh, when you get to the second step, you have to have an interview face-to-face -face with DHS. That has not changed even during the pandemic. Um, and most people are not going to have access to, um, you know, Zoom or some other uh, technology to be able to do it uh, uh, virtually. But also the other issue is, um, were we to try to push for that, um, how would they upload the documents? So that is an issue with the online system is that those documents still have to be presented, pay stubs, your ID and other documents. 
once you get to the next step, you are by federal law required to be approved uh, within 30 days generally. Uh, seven days is usually the time frame it will take uh, for um, someone who has no income at all. Um, or if it's an emergency case, it could potentially be approved that day. One thing that you can push for is for them to print the card in the office at that moment so that that person, especially if you're helping someone who is without a home and so they don't have an address, um, maybe they have to move around, it's not convenient for them to be able to get to the office again to pick it up, um, to try to get it printed that day. That doesn't happen very often, but it is, it is an option that is available that you can advocate for. Um, you are supposed to receive the card within 30 days. Um, if you don't receive the card within 30 days, there's a couple of things that, that they're gonna ask, you know, did you move and not, you know, change your address or whatever. Um, but if you don't receive the card, you have to go through a very tedious process to try to get a new one issued. Um, and it does take a long time. Most people think that if they're approved and they receive the card and they start receiving the benefits, then that ends there of anything that they have to do. Remember that you need to every year certify your income. So you have to renew your eligibility every year with DHS. Um, and if, if you have a substantial change in income, uh, if your income changes from what you reported on the form when you apply, um, you have to report it. If your assets change uh, in a substantial way, you have to report it. And that could make you ineligible for the program. And so you really want to be sure that the understanding is there that receiving the card is not the be all end all of that process. If you are denied, you have the right to appeal that decision. You have 90 days to file an appeal. There is a form that you can use, but you can just write a letter saying you want to appeal it. You do not have to use that form, but that form is gonna give them all the information they're requesting. Um, you will be given an administrative hearing uh, and there will be a final decision. However, that decision could still be wrong. Um, and examples of that are where DHS entered into their system, uh, the income incorrectly, and they, they qualified you for benefits, but you didn't qualify for them. So again, coming to this final decision doesn't mean actually the end all be all. DHS could later come back and move against you to recoup those benefits. And if that happens, uh, clients are gonna need assistance to advocate on their behalf because if it was DHS's error, they should not be seeking uh, penalties against the client. And, and they do not actually have to seek the full, the, the payment back. That, that is a, a state option that we have selected to do. Most states do that because if they do, they they don't get the um, federal portion. They, they have to repay the federal portion. Uh, so next slide. So here we go. This is what I was talking about in terms of documentation. Um, this is a long list um, and it, it applies for both SNAP and T, which is Transitional Employment Assistance. Um, but you need your social security number for yourself and every person that is applying. You need proof of your legal status, uh, that you're a US citizen or that you're an immigrant that is otherwise qualified. Um, here it's important to note that immigrants have to live in the United States for a minimum of five years as a legal permanent resident before they are eligible to apply, except in certain circumstances, such as people who are victims of human trafficking, they're immediately eligible to apply once they get a letter from the Federal Department of Human Health, Health and Human Services. Um, but there are very few immigrants who are not permanent residents who have lived here for five years who will qualify for uh, food stamps. However, if the primary person, the parent, the adult in the household doesn't qualify, that does not mean that everybody in the household doesn't qualify. One of the things that we really need to advocate for at the administrative level is a change in language on the forms. 
the way that the forms are worded makes it seem like if you're applying for this benefit on behalf of your children, you could get into trouble even though you're not applying for yourself. If your children are US citizens and you do not have, you meet the income requirements, they are entitled to the food. And so we should not be scaring them away. We should not be using scare, tax, scare tactics to dissuade people from applying for benefits that they need, especially during a pandemic, which has hit so many people so hard. And we know that there is no more fundamental thing than food. If your children don't have food, you can't worry about paying your rent. You can't worry about paying your car note. You can't worry about paying for anything else. Um, you can see also you have to have proof of identity for the applicant. That's typically gonna be a driver's license or a state ID. Um, if not, then you get into a list of secondary documents and that becomes a lot more complicated if they, if, in particular, um, if, you're, um, if you don't have a, a primary state ID, you have to have proof of residence, which is gonna be utility bills and proof of all income. Uh, one, one of the cases that I had back when I was a practicing immigration lawyer, uh, one of the clients that we were assisting who, who was a victim of domestic violence and therefore qualified for food stamps, um, they denied her three times before she came to us. When she came to us and we called to find out why it was being denied, it was being denied because her baby who was less than a year old was, did not have proof of her income. Um, so this is why it's important to document all of these things that are happening because these decisions don't happen in silos. So every time this is happening, uh, you individually may see a pattern, but it, it might, if, if you don't document it and it's not shared, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and then again, proof of the resources, you can look for proof of medical bills and things of that nature. Um, these last two are, are strictly for transitional employment assistance, so they don't, they don't apply to SNAP. Uh, next slide. So when we talk about knowing your rights, you want to start with the Arkansas um, policy guide. This is a very, very long PDF. It's very long. It is what the policy is, though. So if, if they're going to point to a reason why they're saying you have to bring in income for a one-year-old, it has to be in that book or it's not a valid, re it's not a valid thing. Um, the, the second document is a much quicker, it's a quick eligibility guide to figure out who generally qualifies, what the benefits are, that type of thing, so you can get a basic understanding. Um, and then I have also on here um, the SNAP, oh, I'm sorry. So the first one is actually the Arkansas um, SNAP eligibility chart. I apologize. It's the full chart that shows you income levels, what you need exactly in Arkansas, what the asset limits are, all of those things. Here is the SNAP policy manual. This is the very long, long document that explains all of the policies that go into how SNAP is administered in Arkansas. And then the, the last bullet point here that is really important that people never think about is our Freedom of Information Act. Arkansas um, Freedom of Information, we are what's called a sunshine state. And basically that means that Arkansas believes pretty much most records should be disclosed. And so that means if you are really having a case that you believe is approvable, but you're running into consistent problems, FOIA may be a solution for you because you are, the individual is entitled to request their own case file. Uh, it may exclude some information, like for example, um, they may contact outside people like your employer to determine um, your income. So it might be, their names may be redacted, things like that. But generally speaking, your entire case file is gonna be there so you can see if something does not match with what you put. And that is really important because what we're seeing across, across states um, when we talk to different advocates is that the same issues are coming up for example, overpayments that were not the, the client's fault, um, where DHS is really pursuing them hard um, and refusing to make acknowledgements. In one case, uh, they wanted the client to sign a release form 
um, waiving their <laughs> waiving their right to sue DHS for for false information. Basically, they were they were claiming that the client had entered false information. The client had proof of what they had entered, and so they were in order for DHS to waive the repayment. They were requiring the client to lie on an official document that was going to go to the federal government. Never a good idea. But also, you want to make sure that those kinds of things are not in your file somewhere, that something was put in your file that didn't match up with what you submitted, because it can happen, because caseworkers are overworked, they're handling huge caseloads, and many things are complicated at this moment because of COVID. So it's even much harder for people right now. There may be notes of conversations with you that didn't occur, and so that's why keeping a record is really important. Okay, next slide. So, so when we talk about developing a shared agenda for advocacy, when we talk again about writing everything down, every date and time that you go to the DHS office or that you sent an email, print it out, um, I, I would say don't call, but we do know that the way the system works in Arkansas is that might be the only way you can get a hold of the office. So you wanna write down as much information as you can. The location of the office, the caseworker, what was said, you know, if they promised you a decision in five days, five days passes, you need to call right away. Um, and then the goal of this project really is to talk about how, how this can be a shared agenda for, for uh, administrative advocacy. Osiris talked earlier about getting to know the um, DHS uh, officials, right? Many of them will not so if you have an individual case that makes a lot of attention, let's say it gets seven on your side, picks up the story or something, right? That case will be resolved very quickly so that it goes away. And then there's not a systemic um, look into what are the issues happening with the Department of Human Services and the SNAP program. But we know from anecdotal stories, not just in Arkansas, but in other states of what is happening all around the country, especially during the pandemic where offices shut down and people were not able to access benefits uh, except for through you know, um, a paper form that they had to fill out and put in a hole in the door because they, they the offices were closed for months on end, okay? So um, we have created a, shared Google form where you can report information about people that you're helping um, and what is going on in that case. What has happened, what has been decided, whatever the issue is. If, if for example, they were turned away and told that SNAP benefits can only be applied for Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, that is something that you can document and submit through the shared form. And we will be collecting this data and that will give us a look because we are not all over the state. You guys are all over the state. That will give us a look at what is happening. And we will be able to see not just what policies are that really need to be replaced, but also what are the um, gaps in teaching? What are the um, issues where uh, maybe it's not necessarily the policy, but it's it's uh, the way offices are working. And so we know this is a shared understanding of different um, uh, offices, excuse me, not just uh, one office, um, or even if it is one office, but it's a continual pattern of the same types of denials that are, that are frivolous. This will allow us to collect that information and share it. So Rebecca, I don't know if you can click that link that where it says report. There you go. And so it's just basic general information that we're asking and um, your name, your email, your phone number, if you're the person applying, if you're a caseworker or some other relationship to the person, um, and then the date of the issue. So every time something happens, let's say five things happen on different days, you can report every single one of those things every each time. You don't have to wait and save them up. You can do it each time. Um, and at the very end, if there's something else, it, you know, if you still want help, it, it asks that, if you need us to help you in some way, if there's some advocacy point that we need to get involved in. Um, and then also, um, 
at the Hunger Alliance, they have a help line that actually does assist with cases. So they, Tomiko would be able to help get it, you know, get the caseworkers there directly involved. But also if there's some other thing that you need to explain to us, like you, you got your Medicaid, but your SNAP was denied. Well, Medicaid and SNAP are based on the same documents and the same eligibility income criteria. So if you, if you didn't get one, and you did, but you got the other, why did that happen? And you're trying to figure out what's going on. Those are the types of things that we can collect information on. Um, but whatever the issue may be, you'll be able to submit it through this Google Doc, and that will be um, available through the follow-up email that we'll send out after, um, after the end of this presentation in a couple of days. So uh, next slide. So yeah, we've reached the end and we are ready for any questions. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we will uh, get to them. Okay, so the first question is, what is the percentage of, household, of a household's food budget that is provided by SNAP? I don't, I don't know that we could answer that for you. It depends on the size of the household and how much they're qualified for, um, you know, how much they qualify for. As, as I said, if you are a single person um, who is um, who is eligible for SNAP, the maximum benefit is $87. So is $87 gonna cover the entirety of your food budget for a month? No. Uh, is it gonna cover most of it even? Probably not. So um, it really depends on the individual family that we're talking about, the size and how much they personally qualify for because of their income and their asset levels. Yeah, and I just, I wanna add to that because there was another good question about like a two pager for eligibility and access questions. Since it is so specific per household, it's really, I'm going to use the word scary to put all of the information on one or two pages, but there are tools that we have for specific populations. So, you know, people over 60, people who are receiving dis disability benefits have to meet certain criteria or eligible for a certain amount are uh, qualified for a certain number of months. Uh, people who are students and working part-time or are parents and students, you know, there's so many different situations that people might be in when they turn to SNAP. We have some very, very basic information, but we don't have anything that is comprehensive for every population that applies for SNAP. So just putting that out there. But Next question is the poverty line is ridiculously low, which makes it hard for people who need resources to access them. Um, is there any way to advocate for adjustment of the poverty lines in our state? So that would not be an administrative um, issue. That would actually be a legislative state issue. Uh, I think there's definitely room for us to legislate for that. Um, and to advocate at the legislative level. Um, but, um, you know, we had the opportunity this year, there was a very good bill to in, not to even remove the asset limits, which m most states have done. I think it's like 30, 30 something states have removed the asset limit. So we, we had the opportunity to increase it a little bit. That was what we, what the bill was. And, and that could not gain traction. So we need a lot more voices at the Capitol when it's legislative, legislative time. Um, and I'll just put a push here. Uh, Arkansas Advocates is currently working on developing a tax coalition. Um, and uh, the, the sort of goal, I don't know if I want to say goal, but like what we're trying to do is develop a, a child positive um, uh, budget agenda, really. Uh, so this is something that can definitely be advocated for at the legislative level, but this wouldn't be something we could take up. The administrative offices don't get to decide that. And 
SNAP is administered at the state level and really determined by the feds and the farm bill. Um, it could even go, I mean, those poverty lines are determined by, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name. The answer is that state, state power is pretty restricted when it comes to the overall entitlement program of SNAP. So we can opt into all sorts of um, waivers and opportunities to expand access to the program. But when it comes to the basic income guidelines, each state is determined by a federal the, state. The federal government determines the, the what is the poverty guideline per year. Um, that is a huge other like session we would have to do to talk about all the things that are wrong with that. Um, it was created when food was the most costly thing that you purchased. And that is, has not been the case for more than 30 years. So, um, so that, that is correct. That, that piece by itself, but like the percentage that's allowed that we determine that. So, so what is Arkansas's poverty guideline that we have to go by is determined by the federal government. What is the percentage that we allow, like the 125% of poverty or 100% of poverty, you get to choose what where you want to put that line to allow however many people in, we choose that at the state legislature. And we don't do it in Arkansas. That's the broad-based categorical eligibility stuff that Maricela was talking about. But go after it, man. If you are frustrated and you are justly frustrated, talk to our senators, talk to our house reps, tell them that that poverty line is unacceptable. Well, and I think too, it's important, you know, to note that uh, Senator Bozeman is the chair of the Ag Committee at the federal level. So it's worth it uh, to talk about, Tamiko, that we're the Hunger Alliance and Arkansas Advocates will be having a session in um, August uh, to talk about how to talk to your legislators about hunger issues specifically. Um, and um, he has a lot of sway over the farm bill um, and also um, um, the hunger bill. So there, there, is, there are things that can be done and there are pushes that can be made. Um, it, and it's important when you're collecting information as well that you um, collect data from the people that they wanna hear from. So that's why we're saying we wanna share this document with people throughout the state because at the, at, at, at the state level, we need people, we need stories from all of the counties in Arkansas, but at the state level uh, or at the federal level, sorry, we, we can pull stories from anywhere in Arkansas that are about SNAP and share those with Senator Bozeman. And we are, encourage you for sure to um, participate in that event. It'll get sent out if you're on the mailing list. And Thankfully, this session is going till 7.30. We have a lot more questions coming in. So we have uh, plenty of time to answer um, more questions, but kind of related to the previous question, um, someone said, what I never understood is why the federal government programs go off gross income instead of net income. Any knowledge behind that insight? It's a way to exclude people. Um, so um, it, it, if you have uh, certain things that your job pays for that are taken out of your check or that your job allows you to have, but it's taken out of your check, like your health care or whatever, um, they don't want that to allow you to be opted in when if they use the gross, they can eliminate. It's a, it's a barrier, that's the only reason. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Tommy or Osiris, did you have anything to add to that? Okay, um, next uh, question. DHS has started requiring a check in the middle of, the, of your year as well. You can lose benefits if you don't turn in the two-page document they send you um, within the time limit they give you. Any 
comments on that document? That sounds like a recertification form or an annual review. Um, those are things that have existed for a while, but depending on what types of households are subject to them could be huge barriers to continuing to receive a benefit that you're eligible for. Um, oftentimes, those documents are sent from mailing centers or distribution centers like Pine Bluff is one. So it'll say like Jefferson County. And if I live in Searcy County and I get something from Jefferson County, I might look at that and say like, this isn't for me. This is a mistake. So um, all that's required on that form is a signature saying, yeah, everything's the same. But if I was not expecting that, if I was not told during my interview or if I was, you know, misunderstood or forgot from the year ago interview that I had with my caseworker, I might misunderstand that that documentation is required for me to continue to receive SNAP. Um, and then because of COVID, they did a lot of, we applied for, I think, every single waiver that the feds offered us, um, which meant that we were also able to defer some of the eligibility rigmarole, I don't even know what to call it. Like we were able to say, okay, so this is your situation. You have lost your job due to COVID, da, 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 da. You qualify, we'll follow up with you later to verify that information is correct. So that might be another, another thing people are receiving that's new. Um, but periodically DHS will send something out that is not, you know, doesn't have anything on the front of the envelope that says like, please don't throw me away, which would be really nice. And we've, we've definitely advocated for that at the administrative level. Like, is there anything you can do to let people know that even though this is not the source of where they might've applied for benefits, this is for them. And cost is a barrier there for the state. Okay, the, another question, any new updates on the second round of P EBT? We have a few families who've asked about it. That's all you, Tomika. <laughs> mm, um, so pandemic EBT is the way that the federal government responded back last year when schools were shut down. So um, the pandemic EBT is really just a way to get what would have been free or reduced price lunch benefits to students. Um, who were unable to access those free meals because schools were closed and they had to go virtual. So pandemic EBT this time around, clearly we are in the summer, right? So we applied for the second round of pandemic EBT late. We were approved late, um, but we were approved. So people who are eligible for PEBT will receive four separate payments, one for, August, September, October, November, December, January. I mean, maybe not then because that's when we are off. So January, February, March, April, May. So like the, the 2021 school year, they should, if your child or if any child received um, free meals, had to go virtual, was identified by the school district to the state, that they were virtual on the last date of the data poll, um, I'm getting way too in the weeds here, you will get a small amount of benefit that will go directly to students. So SNAP participating households will see that benefit on their regular EBT card. People who are not SNAP participating, but have a student who attends a school where they feed every student for free, or they filled out that free or reduced price meal form, and their kid would have been receiving meals for free or a reduced price, we'll see a small amount, 
we'll, we'll receive a, a card that's like a really blank, boring card that has the name of their child on it. And that will come loaded with a certain amount of benefits. Those benefits should all be distributed by the end of this month. There is a call center that DHS wants everybody to reach out to, and I'll put that in the chat too, but it's the PEBT call center, 833-316-2421. That's open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. That is the direct source. So Conduent, there are two EBT providers in the nation, Conduent and FIS. Conduent is the one that we contract with. They are the ones that are running the call center. So if somebody didn't receive a card, they knew that they were eligible, there's a list that Conduent has, they'll issue that card out. There will be a number of issues with this round of PEBT because it is very specific to each household. Um, it's Happy to take to each child, even. Right? So, like, your child that's in one school might get $50, and your child that's in another school might get $100. And, and we can't tell you how much it's going to be because the data, how much a person is going to get is dependent on whether or not they were enrolled virtually on the day, that, the last day of the month that they pulled the data and how many days virtual there were. So uh, that could be different by school, um, depending on how many days they were closed because of COVID. So um, we, we could not tell you whether an amount is correct uh, because that is, is really dependent on what the school reported in. What I will say about it, the number one thing, especially in, um, the immigrant community is to make sure that the school district had your correct address um, because if they did not, then conduit set that card to whatever address was on file. Um, and so um, that, that can be one of the complications, um, especially we know many families had to move around, switch households, uh, share households during COVID. So, um, uh, that can be a complication. If they did not have your correct address, then you're going to need to call that call center and see what can be done um, because that, that is a complication. And the, there was one other question. You mentioned the number. Did you also say, was there an email address for uh, PEBT customer service? No. Not that we have right now. So I was just text, I mean, I was typing that up to Erica. Last time around with PEBT, we didn't have a conduit call center and the SNAP department of DHS just wanted everything to go through them. So they gave out an uh, like a PEBT at dhs.arkansas.gov kind of email address. I would not use that if you still have that. Um, and they have not shared an email address that they would prefer people to use. I would say if you're having any issues getting through the call center, which we know can be an issue, and we, we know that they're also tracking the number of um, minutes people are waiting for an answer, um, which is good, not helpful for the person that's waiting, but helpful for us when we're trying to change policy later. Um, I would say that Facebook is a really, unfortunately, it's a good uh, way to get your message across if you have not been supported through the helpline. And then talk to our Alliance customer service folks, our Alliance Snap Art call center, because we can send emails directly to some of our contacts at DHS and say, hey, can you follow up on, on this? Um, summer EBT, sorry, Rebecca, I'm just looking at the chat right now. My understanding is that we have not been approved for summer EBT yet. We have been told that that application has been submitted, but we have not been approved. Likely those benefits will not go out until the next school year starts since we're so behind. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. And I think that was our last question. 
And, and I'll just, um, so to add on to what Tamika was saying about, you know, calling out, called the Alliance, but also um, we're gonna send the link to the Google Doc. We really are collecting this information to share it with DHS uh, officials. This is not a, we're just collecting it to collect it. This is, the goal is to fix these policies that we know inherently are disproportionately affecting poor people, um, people who do not have time to sit on a call center call line for two hours um, waiting to get their question answered, especially when it was DHS, DHS's mistake. So I would encourage you if you face those issues to also not just call the Alliance to get it resolved, but also report the issue there because we're collecting that data separately and those are gonna be collected as a group and, and used for the, the shared process moving forward. I wanna thank everybody for being here, especially our speakers tonight, Tamiko Townley from the Arkansas Hunger Relief Alliance, Osiris Bali from the Arkansas Public Policy Panel, um, and I wanna thank Rebecca Zimmerman, especially who did all the tech uh, because I am not the Zoom person. So um, thank you so much. And if you have any uh, follow-up questions, we will be sending an email with a survey about this. Uh, you'll get it in a few days, as well as the link to the Google document where you can submit any reports of issues that you encounter um, and the follow-up information if you want to contact any of us. Thank you so much. Thank you all.